Let's bring you this story now, and it is that of rapist and convicted murderer Tabo Pesta and his partner, Dr. Nandipa Makudumana. It continues to grab the nation's attention with many twists and turns. Besta escaped from the Mangaung Correctional Center on the 3rd of May last year by faking his own death. Now, a body was found inside his cell, initially believed to be that of Besta's, but it has since been identified as belonging to Katlejo Bereng. Well, we chat now to News 24's legal journalist, Karen Morn, who has written a very, very uh, troubling story today. And you talk about how Dr. Nandi Pamakudumana unsuccessfully tried to smudge her own fingerprints at a particular uh, hospital. Talk to us about that. Let, let's start there. I think one of the major questions that emerged after Katlejo Baring Mpolo's body was identified over the weekend, you know, by, his, uh, by the police, they confirmed that, was how did they manage to find out who this person was? Mm. Um, and it's now emerged that, you know, on this uh, sort of campaign that Nandipa went on, Dr. Magodomana went on, to claim a series of bodies in the days prior to Besta's escape, that she had in fact sought to claim and successfully claimed his um, you know we've got to get those timelines when this matter emerges in court mm. but that she had f put her fingerprint and tried to smudge apparently she protested a lot when mortuary officials were asking her to put her fingerprint there were all kinds of protests they said we're not going to do this until you actually give us a fingerprint she then smudges the fingerprint but they are still able to use that document and Katlejo's fingerprint on it to start trying to trace his identity and of course Home Affairs then comes and says we believe it's this individual they then go through missing persons dockets mm. and are able to, to I, I, I ascertain that he had gone missing or was reported missing in May last year um, and from then they're able to say we do believe that it is him and then approach his mother and uh, obtain DNA evidence from her which matches with him part of your story talks about how Katlejo had been targeted mm. by Makudumana and those that she allegedly was working with. Just take us back to why did he become a person of interest for what ultimately would be his charred remains in the prison cell of uh, Tabo Pesta? I think this is one of the more horrifying and disturbing aspects of, of this case. And I think when this bail application proceeds next week, we are going to get those level of insights because I very much understand that the state is going to oppose the bail for several of the accused in this matter. But it is the state's belief that while certain bodies were, were claimed and then abandoned, you know, one of them in a river, um, as part of a sort of dry run for the ultimate escape, that there was a potential targeting of Katlejo Bereng because he was the same age. Besta was about 33, Bereng was 32. Mm. Um, and there also seems to be evidence, as, as shown by Ground Up, that he had a connection with the prison guard who has now been charged, that they knew each other, that they drank at the same tavern. We also note, Goli, from the parliamentary process, that G4S and, and Integraton um, Integrated Solutions has handed in a statement from an interpreter who was present with the CCTV operator, Mr. Leporo, um, when he went and did a polygraph test and attested to the fact that this Lepolo had spoken about some kind of kidnapping and the fact that two prison guards would be responsible for bringing the dead body. Mm. Now, these are all issues that need to be, um, you know, ventilated in a court process. But we also know um, that Mr. Bering did die of unnatural causes. He had a hairline fracture on his right, the right side of his temple. Mm. Blunt force trauma to the, uh, to the head is his cause of death. Um, you know, we, we spoke to a pathologist who sort of spoke to, uh, took us through the fact that had he been able to receive medical attention after suffering that in injury, he may have survived it. But it is very clearly evident that he was struck on the head and that is what killed him. So all of these factors together have led the state to believe that he, there was a deliberate attempt, um, a, a successful attempt to murder him as a, as a decoy body for this escape plot. And of course, the interesting thing is, is that during this bail application process, that evidence will emerge. And Dr. Nandipa Magodamana is going to have to explain to the court exactly why 
she went and claimed three bodies within a short space of time that were not genetically related to her, mm. those bodies ending up one of them in a river. And this young man, who she then goes into a court of law in Pretoria and says, this is my customary law husband, with the support of her father, who is also in the dock, saying, I got Lebola for her, 60,000 rand, etc. So, Knowing so full that's well, the connection, I'm sorry yes, to disturb you. Yes. So that's the connection that then brings the father into this case. Absolutely. He went, there's evidence in that court application that he goes and tries to claim um, Katlejo's body on the proposition from a, from a funeral parlor in Soweto saying, no, it's, it's, it's his customary son-in-law. We know, of course, that that was not correct. And when Mago, Mago Domana goes to the court urgently and says, this is my customary law husband, I'm entitled to his body, she accuses the police of all kind of wrongdoing, she's being victimized, etc., etc. Her father goes under oath in that court process and says, yes, I negotiated Lebola in like late 2020 with his late uncle and, you know, goes into great detail about drinking alcohol with this man, etc., etc. So he supports her in getting the body and the, the state's case very much is that he was, was knowing the part of that. We don't know if that's what his defense is going to be, but that's the evidence that we have so far. And so it, very interestingly, we know that the state decided to withdraw murder charges against the father and so the main charge here would be what exactly an accessory to and also the fraud you know that you you made false you went to you went and said look this guy's my my customary son-in-law knowing full well that he wasn't but i think the fascinating thing here is what we're going to see in the next few days is who flips and we're going to see People in that situation, I think, you know, there's, there's every indication, Mr. Lepola, the CCTV um, operator, he actually handed himself over to police. That emerged in Parliament. Yeah. That, you know, he'd, he'd, after having done this polygraph test, making these admissions to the translator, these hearsay admissions, which, of course, are not admissible in a court process, he then hands himself over. Yeah. Um, and it's going to, you know, the state, I think that, you know, there, there are already suggestions from some of the news reports that we've seen that Dr. Maga Dumana may have told the authorities that she was the victim of GBV, that she had been abused. And I think what is going to be fascinating is to see, which I think is going to happen, a potential flip from her onto Bester mm. and how the state then navigates that process. And so, in other words, she may possibly turn state witness, is it? Well, I don't think the state would accept that because she might try and do that. She might do and try and do a plea and sentence. and she could opt to be a Section 204 witness, in which case she's granted immunity in exchange for honest evidence. I don't believe for one second the NPA will accept that. Or one, it's what's called a Section 105A plea and sentence deal, where you plead guilty, but you get a lesser sentence in exchange for evidence. Mm -hmm. But probably the weight of evidence that is against her. Um, and the clear question that will be asked if she makes an argument of, well, I was a victim of GBV, well, why did you then assist this man in getting released from prison? Yeah. Um, our own work on this, and Ground Up has done absolutely exemplary reporting on this, but you know, following on from the very good work that we've done, we have gone through his prison records, and prior to Nandipa arriving on the scene, when she first starts visiting him 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. his life in prison is miserable. Um, she then hires a lawyer to start writing to the Judicial Inspectorate of Correctional Services, complains about his conditions. Um, and as we know, like 2018, he's running a gala event from his prison cell with many of the same connections that she had. So she was game-changing in, in his life. And, um, you know, why exactly she would have done that, we don't know as yet what her defense will be. But it's clear that she was instrumental in assisting him to escape. I want to just let you on to that theme that he had a miserable life in, in prison up until the introduction into the scene of Dr. Nandi Pamakutumana. The story that he ran a successful business from inside prison. Connect the dots for us there. Well, what's been fascinating is because we have the prison records, we've been phoning a number of the people who visited him and a number of the people that he listed as contacts, including a very well-known celebrity who you and I will, will both know. We've seen her on the TV screens. Mm -hmm. And what is fascinating to me is that he seems to have done this thing where he said, my name is Tom Motsepe, I'm a, I'm a relative of the Motsepe family, but I'm in prison under a fake name. Because, you know, my family, you know, it's a whole political thing. People can't know who I am. And he was 
he was very heavily involved in the entertainment um, industry to the extent this, this 21st century media company into which several million rand was sunk he was able to have a gala dinner um, in that, you know, as that entity and have a number of completely, you know, unwitting people attend that event, not knowing that actually this person is running this business. You know, the chairman who is in New York is in fact in prison. And the, the, the interesting thing is, is that by claiming he's in New York, of course, it allows him not to call people during the day, which mm. is when he's in prison doing his thing. He says, no, I'm in New York. I can't contact you. A number of the women that we spoke to said, no, he'd only call them at night. You know, you'd be like, oh, I've just woken up in New York, you know. The guy, you know, the tragedy of this is, is that this man is highly, highly, highly intelligent, but he's very, very dangerous. Mm. And his intelligence has been used to rape two completely innocent women using the internet, which has always been his major uh, force of fraud, to, to kill a woman that he claimed was his girlfriend, that he stood by him when he was facing all these accusations, mm. and then to defraud multiple other women whilst in prison. Um, and the interesting thing, Goli, is that he was receiving visits from women that he claimed to be this very successful billionaire with after the start of his relationship with Nandipa, according to her, she says they started dating in 2017. So the real question for me is, was she knowingly part of that fraud mm -hmm. or was she just being cheated on yeah. you know, in, in that context? Here's another troubling story around this. And we're going to talk in a moment about what you write in your report as a conversation with uh, the dead Katleho Bereng's father. Mm. Let's, let's talk about the, the escapes from prison, not necessarily escape, but the story that suggests that Tabo Pesta would have been let out of prison and sort of led a very nice life where he goes out of prison and then he's taken back. Is that indeed a fact? I think that that is still disputable because mm. Those hotel invoices are around about the same time when these like dry runs occur because he asks to be moved to an isolation cell on the 15th of April. Um, and it, it, you know, it very much, and we see glitches in the CCTV happening yeah. that exact time. So I think there were dry run attempts. And I think that Nandipa was possibly in Bloemfontein booking a hotel under two names because she, she was potentially preempting that he would escape there. Yeah. But, you know, maximum security prisons are extremely difficult to get out of. Um, you know, it's, there's biometrics, there's multiple gates. You really have to plan it very, very carefully. Um, so escaping you know, is in the way that he did, would have taken a lot of time, planning and effort. Mm -hmm. But to come in and out of it in that way, I'm not sure that we have enough evidence to support that. And certainly one of the invoices that's provided by the hotel um, references Nandipa ordering food for 200 rand. Now, if there were two people there, mm -hmm. that seems pretty minimal. I mean, it may well be that that was the case. Certainly Ground Up's also been conservative in their reporting on this. They've said that it's clear that she was there. But it might be, you know, evidentially a bit of a leap to say that he was going to on vacations with Nandipa, you know, as it, as it as has been pointed out on Twitter. Let's conclude the conversation then with um, the grieving family mm. of Katleho. And the understanding is that the father was still trying to make some kind of connection with his son, whom he had not really had had a relationship with. So talk to us about that. Well, no, the father's spoken about the fact, he spoke to my colleague Yashil about the fact that, you know, he'd had um, Katlejo when they, he, he and Katlejo's mother were very young. Mm. And he'd only reconnected him with him when he was 18. And, you know, sort of explained to him, you know, I, I was a very young person. I'm sorry, you know, that I wasn't necessarily present in your life. And the thing that he said was that, you know, he said to Katlejo, you mustn't make the same mistakes as I did. Be present in the lives of your children. And Katlejo was. Um, he one of the children, most, He Katlejo. had two children. And, and the mother of one of those children has come forward and said, you know, she, she posted on Facebook in, in Sisutu and said, I always knew you loved your children and so I couldn't understand why you abandoned them. Because he just disappeared. Mm. 
And you know, Koli, I've done a lot of stories around what the apartheid state used to do to activists where they would destroy their bodies. And you know, we've got a terrible history in this country of that being used to inflict untold pain and trauma. You know, mm. we know that a lot of people, for example, went to the TRC and just begged for one bone yeah. so that they could bury that family member and that family member could, their soul could be with their ancestors and with their family. And it's got a deep thing in our culture as South Africans that mm. you, you, you are able to find closure, you are able to say goodbye. And the terrible thing about this is that Katlejo Bereng Mpolo died in a violent way mm. and you know, we will hear evidence about that. But it's one thing to violently take someone's life. It's quite another to do that on the allegation of the state and then to basically try and ensure that their family will never know what happened to them. If, if that fingerprint hadn't been, if the state hadn't done the successful investigation that it had done, mm -hmm. his family, his children, his loved ones would go their entire lives having no idea what had happened to him. And that is a different form of torture, and that is a different form of crime, and that is an altogether different form of cruelty. And that's why probably the, the mother of uh, Katlejo is inconsolable. Mm -hmm. We had had a conversation with Linda Mnisi, who was talking to the grandmother, and you could just see the mother in agony. She just didn't speak during that interview. But uh, thank you for at least giving us some legal direction as to where this case might go. Uh, Karen Morn is uh, News24's uh, legal journalist.